Welcome to the podcast from Eden Worship Center. Because we believe that it is God's word that does God's work in God's people, we want you to hear the gospel preached in the gathering of believers. We want you to read it for yourself and to join us as we think together and talk together about the sermon from this past week and what's going on in our world. You can join the conversation by sending in your comments and questions to EdenWC at Hotmail.com. May God cause His Word to come alive in your heart today. Well, hey everybody, welcome to the EWC Midweek Podcast. Pastor Matt here. Just want to take a second and talk with us about the sermon from this past week. It was awesome to have Tim Miller, one of our elders here at Eden Worship Center, sharing God's word with us. Uh, He has gone through school of ministry and uh, him and his wife, Sharla, serve as our uh, youth leaders, youth pastors here at Eden Worship Center. And so it was just great to have him share, even though it was slightly out of his comfort zone, just appreciate that uh, so much, him willing to step in and share God's word. Uh, We were looking at the end of Philippians chapter four. We've been in Philippians for a few months now, going verse by verse through the book. And he was looking at the end of chapter four, verses 21 and 22, that says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Now, I don't know if you've given any thought to what is involved in preaching, in uh, putting something together to share as a sermon with God's people from God's word. Uh, but just on the surface, that's not a whole lot to work with. <laughs> that's just sort of like uh, at the end of a letter that you would get. And it's like, uh, Sincerely, grandma loves you, you know, grandma, whoever. Uh, There's not a whole lot to work with there. And I thought Tim did a great job of pulling us back into the book and developing some of these uh, themes that Paul has been talking about with the Philippian church for a while of uh, what it means to find joy in Christ, what it means that we are joined and united one with another in Christ. Uh, How do we fix our minds on the right thing and, and, uh, contemplate, meditate upon that which is uh, good and pure and holy and beneficial to us and not have our minds fixed on something else. Uh, anyways, it, he he spent a lot of time uh, taking us back through the book. And, and this coming Sunday, we're, we're going to do a bit broader of a scope look at that as uh, my dad, our founding pastor, Harold Gingrich, is going to finish up our study in Philippians and uh, recap the book together. Lord willing, but uh, I just want to consider a couple things as we we think about this this wrapping up. Um, One of the things Tim pointed to was uh, when we look at these verses that there's a few different components there. Paul says he's writing from Rome, uh, writing from prison to this Philippian church uh, located in Philippi. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. So every saint there is all the saints who are there with them at the church in Philippi. And then Paul says, the brothers who are with me greet you. So now there's there's brothers uh, both in the church and those who are working together with Paul uh, who are sending their greetings to them. Uh, and this word greet that just pops up again and again and again, these two short verses, uh, really has this idea of embrace. Uh, not, just, not just a cursory uh, saying hi uh, or, you know, as we do kind of driving around in, in our area. In fact, people who aren't from our area think our area is super weird because we drive around and wave at each other for like no good reason. Uh, Somebody will just be uh, walking on the side of the road or driving down and people from here are waving and uh, people from the big city are like, you guys are crazy. Stay to yourself. Uh, It's more than that, more more than just a a, a glancing wave. It it really has this idea of embracing one another, Uh, even as the Bible is going to talk about uh, in other places of greeting one another with a holy kiss. That this is this is a welcoming, uh, uh, like we are we are together, we are connected in this. Uh, and then he says, all of the saints greet you. So not just the ones who are with him, but all of the saints in, in the other churches and in, in all the places that Paul has contact with uh, send their greetings along. And then he says, especially those of Caesar's household. Now, these are probably people that Paul is in contact with because he has the profound privilege of being in prison. Uh, we don't often think about prison as being a privilege, but Paul is uh, being held by the Praetorian guard, uh, Caesar's guard. 
And uh, that has put him not only in contact with them, but with Caesar's household. And uh, he said at the beginning of this book, all of Caesar's household, all of these guards uh, have heard the gospel. They've heard the story. They know why Paul is there uh, because evidently Paul just wouldn't shut up. Uh, Whatever circumstance he's going to say to us later on in that letter, uh, whatever circumstance I find myself in, I I found the secret of being content that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, And so Paul is talking about the gospel, but evidently he's also talking about this Philippian church that he has gone out of his way to say how much he loves and cares, the the affection that he has for this church. And so I I, just a couple thoughts real quick on it. Um, Churches have uh, sort of depending on where you are, what what region you're in, what people make up the church, churches tend to have sort of their own distinct uh, flavor to them, uh, their own characteristics to them. And and you can have uh, Two churches that are relatively near to each other, uh, same basic community, uh, but just the the people and the personalities that make it up can make uh, the t- two churches look very, very different. And I think one of the things that our modern culture sort of uh, bemoans is the fact that, well, there's so much division in the church. I, I just wish there weren't any denominations in the church. And I, I thought it might be helpful just to to think for just a second. The word denomination uh, comes from this idea. We're going to denominate. We're going to say or lay out in an orderly way. This is what we believe. Uh, this is the truth of God's word that we stand upon. I love one of the quotes that uh, Tim had from a sermon. There is only one truth, not my truth, not your truth. It is God's truth and it's God's word. And it, the, that is what we stand upon uh, and from that place of unchanging truth of God's word, uh, we start coming into the individual distinctions of how do we apply that truth to our life. And so the, the further you go down the line with churches in throughout time and church history, uh, the further you go into people's lives and generations, the more you see uh, maybe denominations, churches that started really close to each other sort of spreading out and, and having emphasis on different things. And I, I would just sort of encourage us, those emphasis aren't bad at all. The, the fact that one church stands firmly on God's word here and another, word, uh, another church stands firmly on another part of God's word uh, without either one of them uh, tearing apart the fabric of God's word and saying, well, we don't believe this, we believe that. It, uh, God's word is not a cafeteria where you go through and you take what you want and you skip the rest. Uh, as long as they are orthodox, right teaching, and they are faithful to God's word, uh, it's actually good to have those distinctions. Here's where the bad comes in. And I, I think it's exactly what uh, Tim addressed on Sunday. And that is when uh we either start using those distinctions as an excuse for us to drift further and further from biblical faithfulness. Uh, It's the old cliche that you hear in the church. Well, this is the way we've always done it. We've always done things this way. Uh, And so we begin to rely more and more on uh, the tradition of man rather than scripture, which uh, is a really dangerous thing. The New Testament has a lot to say about that, uh, that we are uh, subverting the gospel Uh, in favor of man's traditions. And we don't want to be guilty of that. I I think another danger, though, is when we start to look at our distinctives, the way our church does things, the way we denominate things, and then we look at somebody else and we start looking more and more condescendingly at them. Now, it's not necessarily on uh, central gospel issues. It's on secondary, things way, way further down the ladder. And yet, uh, we can end up looking down our noses at them. And it, one of the questions Tim asked was, uh, how do you view other Christians? Do you view them with love and brotherhood as those who've been joined together in Christ Jesus or with condescension and suspicion? Where every time I look at a Christian from a different church, every time uh, I see anything or hear anything from a different church, I'm I'm looking with a suspicious eye. Where's where's the fault? How can I find uh, some little fault in this? And I, I don't know if you were ever guilty of this as a kid, where you have like a sweater and it's got like the one little string hanging on it, and I, we just want to pull that string like an obsessive little kid until the whole thing falls apart. And I I think. If we are motivated by faithfulness to God's word, that can be kind of okay. Uh, 
I would say most of the time, though, our motivation actually comes from, I want to prove you wrong and me right. I want to say I'm right and you're wrong. And I, I want everything that you have to fall apart. And then I'll say, see, I told you so. Uh, come to me because I am the purveyor of all wisdom on this. And another question Tim asked is, as we think about that, our relationship with each other, our relationship with God's word, do we have a desire for us to be humbled and Christ to be exalted? Or is our main desire for ourself and our thoughts, our opinions uh, to be elevated as the most important thing? And, and I know there's a lot going on, but you guys got to stop and listen to me. What I'm saying is the most important thing happening here. And it, I think once we get there, we have, we have crossed that threshold into uh, not just being opinionated, but arrogant and condescending, and that will lead to strife and division in the church. And brothers and sisters who uh, are unable to walk together in fellowship and unity because, uh, not because of the doctrinal issues, but because of arrogance that creeps into the church. Look back through church history and just find this time and time again. Uh, by the way, a little good news for us. Uh, we find elements of that in every uh, faithful leader of the church that God raises up in a generation to, uh, to cause more greater faithfulness in that time for that church. Uh, so I don't think we have to be scared of that. If we recognize it in ourself, <clears throat> I don't think we have to be self-deprecating or anything like that. Uh, I think we do what scripture commands us and that's repent. And we, we say, God, forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for my arrogance. Uh, help me see those for whom Christ died. He shed his precious blood as brothers and sisters rather than outsiders that I'm going to view with suspicion. I, I just thought that was really helpful uh, given that that is the aim of all of Christianity is that we have been joined and united with one another, but there's a goal in that uniting. And when you look at uh, Revelation chapter five, uh, John's vision uh, that he has of this, this heavenly throne room that we find in Revelation four and five, uh, here's the goal of every church. Here's the goal of every Christian life. And that is that we might be humbled, we might be cast down, and Jesus might be exalted. Uh, the end of Revelation 5 says, Then I looked and I heard, and this is, by the way, the, uh, the culmination. This is the crescendo at the end of all of this throne room drama that we have seen, this worship around the throne of God. Then I looked and heard around the throne the living creatures, the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads, thousands and thousands, with a loud voice saying, Worthy is the Lamb to be slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth. That's where we make it into this scene. Before that, uh, it's... It's elders and living beasts and angels, but now every creature, every person in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. May it be so. That's what that word means. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Uh, there's there's an exaltation of Christ uh, that is it's not not only central to our life as believers, uh, it is eschatological. It, it is the end of all things that Jesus Christ would be exalted and glorified and worshiped and his people represented in those elders would cast ourselves down before his throne, uh, cast ourselves down at his feet. And for all eternity, uh, say, Jesus, you are the greatest. Uh, you you are supreme and preeminent over all things. Lord willing, we're just getting ready in a couple weeks here to start diving into the book of Colossians. That's the main theme in the book of Colossians, the supremacy of Christ, Christ um, over everything else. Uh, he's supreme. It, he is exalted over everything else. Uh, and he is in us, which is so encouraging. Uh, it's one of the reasons why that uh, same author in Colossians and, and Philippians, it's one of the reasons why Paul throughout this book has come back again and again and again, because that's true, because Christ is supreme, because uh, he is over all things. He's before all things. He created all things and they exist for him. Uh, that sovereign God indwells us by his spirit. Uh, he has chosen to be with us. He has chosen to save us. And if that's true, 
then we can have profound joy in him no matter what our life situation or circumstances look like. And that's that's what Paul is, is pushing for again and again in Philippians. Find your joy in Christ. Find your joy in Christ. As an individual believer, as a husband, as a wife, as part of a family, as part of a church, as part of your job, as part of this world, find your joy in Christ. Christ. He alone is our hope and salvation. So Lord willing, this coming Sunday, we're going to, we're going to overview that. We're going to wrap that up in the book of Philippians and uh, man, what, what a privilege it is to walk through God's word like that. Uh, Several years ago, my dad had wrote a book on Philippians called Let This Mind Be In You. Uh, I think we actually have it on our book table back at the back of our auditorium. So if you're interested, grab one of those on Sunday. So I, it, because he literally wrote the book on it, uh, I thought it would be good to let him wrap up this series and uh, just sort of take us home. But I, I hope as we have gone through it that you've been encouraged to find your joy and your strength in Jesus, uh, not in your circumstances, not in the people around you, not even in your church, uh, in Christ. Uh, all those other things, it, they will change and they will fade and they will disappear. That there will come a day where uh, none of the people, uh, like all seven of you currently listening to this podcast, uh, will not be alive. I won't be here. No one will even remember that we were here. And Jesus Christ will still be supreme over all things. Uh, the church can be gone. The, the building can be gone. And Jesus Christ will still be supreme over all things. So find your hope and joy in him who does not change. In him who there is no shadow of turning or change. Uh, he is eternal and eternally we are his. So what, what an awesome truth that is. Uh, we look forward to worshiping with you this coming Lord's Day. So, Lord willing, we will see you uh, on Sunday. Uh, we have Sunday school for all ages at 9 o'clock, and then uh, the church gathers together for corporate worship at 10 a.m. Lord willing, we will see you then. All right, God bless.